So shall we begin? We're actually starting a minute early, which allows for an early finish, if that's to occur. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you joining this session. I especially appreciate those of you who know us or are acquainted with us, and still you came. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Some of you are virtual. Obviously, some are in person. All are greatly appreciated. My name is Charles Evans. I'm president of the International Health Services Group, and I'm also a senior advisor for international to the American College of Healthcare Executive. By way of introduction to our session, I would like to read a brief statement from the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board 2021 report. And I quote, as of October, over 5 million people have died due to COVID-19. Behind each death, there is a human story, a loss of potential, and an enormous gap left in families and communities. The failures of this pandemic were foretold by many, failures that have roots in, in a long history of inequality and inaction. It's easy to be cynical and to think that nothing can change, that the models of the past cannot be exchanged for better ways of working together that benefit all. But we must reject pessimism, recognize our common humanity and growing interdependence, and create a global health ecosystem that serves everyone. Together, we must move from worlds apart to a world prepared. End of quote. It's clear that a key to moving to a more positive future is to learn from each other now. What has worked, what is sustainable, and what is transferable. This session tells the story of the Abu Dhabi Department of Health's response to the pandemic. Abu Dhabi, you may know, is one of the seven states that comprise the United Arab Emirates and is the capital. They have produced remarkable results. Their management of the crisis has enabled them to maintain a low rate of positive cases and one of the lowest mortality rates per capita in the world. In fact, Abu Dhabi ranks first among 50 leading cities in the world for its response to the coronavirus pandemic, according to a report by London-based analytics consortium, Deep Knowledge Group. The report highlights the capital's outstanding performance on 114 qualitative and quantitative indicators organized in five areas, including government efficiency, economic resilience, quarantine efficiency, healthcare management, and vaccination rates. I should note that Dubai, Abu Dhabi's uh, neighboring emirate, ranked fourth on, among the world, uh, world cities on that, uh, on that study. We're honored to have, as members of this panel, key executives who have provided the, the leadership for Abu, Dhabi, for Abu Dhabi in achieving an their outstanding results for the community. They are Dr. Nawal al Kabi, Dr. Nawal, if you would so indicate. Thank you. She is the Chief Medical Officer for SEHA. SEHA is the corporate name of the Abu Dhabi Health Services Company, which is an independent public company that owns and operates all public hospitals and clinics across the Emirate. So I did research in Abu Dhabi uh, regarding each of these panelists to get a feel for those folks who were doing the work and directly involved as to how they would create a phrase that would exemplify the role that each member played. For Dr. Nawal, it was, she, she is frontline, hands-on, and always engaged. She led in the clinical trials initiative, and she's chairman of the National COVID Clinical Committee. Thank you for being here, Dr. Nawal. The next is Dr. Farida Hassani. 
Dr. Frida is executive director of the communicable diseases sector. Dr. Frida, did you? Hello, thank you. Uh, th this was such an easy one. Everyone I asked said the same thing in describing uh, Dr. Frida, and that is that she is the voice of the pandemic. <laughs> and you'll understand that much more clearly as we proceed. The third is Dr. Omar Najim. Dr. Omar is director of the Executive Affairs Office of the Department of Health. He provides the, he provides the leadership, both in strategic and tactical planning, to assure that expected outcomes are achieved. Not enough to just plan, must assure good results. Thank you, Dr. Omar. And then Ms. Hind Mabarak Azabai, where's, there you are. Uh, she is the executive director for the healthcare facilities sector of the Department of Health. It was clear in talking to my contacts that she is the executive who provided overall leadership for Abu Dhabi's COVID response. She was on top and did a great job. So that's the panel. I'm going to get out of their way. I do want to encourage you to use the app and the chat room for raising questions as we go through the presentation. Now, Ariana is standing by to make sure everyone knows how to do that. So Ariana, would you please provide guidance? Oh, you're talking too soft. <laughs> Now, better? Is the mic on? Okay. Um, there you go. Now, uh, it's really easy. You just have to go inside the app and select the Q&A and then select room three and the time slot that we are right now. And you have to send the question and it will appear on the iPod they have directly. So that's it. Thank you. All right. Any questions about that? We're good to go. All right. Dr. Omar. I think we'll play the video Driven by the continuous support of our wise leadership, Abu Dhabi has faced the COVID-19 challenges with resilience and determination. It is no surprise that the Emirate is ranked first among 25 global cities in response to the pandemic, according to the latest ranking issued by the London-based Deep Knowledge Group. These prestigious global rankings are the product of effort and teamwork. Abu Dhabi's healthcare sector has proven way before the pandemic its efficiency, the strength of its infrastructure and the professionalism of its organizations and staff. Prior to the pandemic, the department launched the first of its kind Istijaba system in the Middle East region. Abu Dhabi enjoys a competitive environment for medical research by issuing standards for medical research and exchanging medical information securely and digitally through Malafi. Deep Knowledge Group's ranking is not a first for Abu Dhabi's response to the pandemic. The department has also won 13 awards from the prestigious 2021 Middle East and North Africa Stevie Awards, many of which were a tribute to the outstanding response to the pandemic. We have achieved several accomplishments in record time. This includes increasing the number of daily tests to detect virus and establishing several testing centers and field hospitals. We have also activated the remote healthcare system, the health workforce upskilling platform, and the healthcare program for senior citizens and people with chronic diseases. Abu Dhabi also took part in the third phase of clinical trials of the COVID-19 Chinese Sinopharm vaccine and the Russian human adenovirus-based vaccine. دولة الإمارات دائما سباقة في أنها تكون هي من ضمن هذه المنظومة لمساعدة البشرية في التغلب على هذا المرض. ونتوقع إن شاء الله في الفترة القادمة أن يكون العقار خارج من دولة الإمارات للعالم. أدعو الجميع 
لانه يكون في هذه اللحظه التاريخيه اللي هي بتسجل على كل شخص يتقدم انه يكون من اوائل الناس لاخذ هذا العقار وان شاء الله انه بهمه رجال اهل الامارات وعيال زايد يرجع العالم كله الى طبيعته كيف ما كان عليها سابقا Abu Dhabi was keen to ensure the quality of services through the Abu Dhabi Healthcare Quality Index Muasha, which won five awards, three of which are gold, in the Middle East Stevie Awards. We will continue to further develop our health sector with the support of our wise leadership and guidance. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, I, I understand it's late on the day and showing up, and we have many of the people online. It's an absolute pleasure on behalf of myself, on behalf of the group, and on behalf of the whole of Abu Dhabi uh, healthcare systems and the people who work there across UAE uh, uh, to be here today. Thank you for having us. Uh, I mean, the most pleasurable thing that we had is seeing the rain today. It's fantastic. Uh, it's been a while, <laughs> uh, so we thoroughly enjoyed the interactions that we've been having, and thank you, IHF, for hosting us and for putting together such a fantastic event. Um, and um, we're looking forward to the future one that is going to be in, in Dubai. We're very proud of this, and uh, we're very proud of uh, the team in, in Dubai who is going to be leading on the next one, and we're looking forward to contributing and making it even a more successful post-pandemic than uh, what used to be even wherever it is in the world. And we are sure of it. Dubai is a fantastic city and the whole UAE is behind it. So what we want to go through today is we came here for learning. We came here to listen to the lessons learned from the last two years. The last two years has impacted many of us. So if, if I can take you back to about December time, 2019, many of us were pulling the paper and pen and putting plans for places to visit, for professional growth to be achieved, for personal growth to be achieved, for people to know that are new and for new things to try. And be known to many of us, the world has gone through a pandemic and uh, a challenge that it's easy to describe as the biggest in our lifetime. It's a challenge that every single person, every society, every economy around the world has gone through. There isn't a safe place around the world that can say, I didn't know about the pandemic or the pandemic didn't impact me. And what we are trying to put together today is the, the story of Abu Dhabi, how we arrived at where we are today. And we think it's a, it's a story worth sharing, uh, not only for us and the UAE to be proud of, but also about the lessons that we learned along the way. We saved many lives, but we also lost lives that we truly and sadly remember that without that global pandemic would have still be around with us. Many of us know somebody or know a society or know a community that has been impacted economically or been impacted disruption wise or even a businesses that didn't get to what they wanted to get over the last two years. And we think that story we are telling today is there are many things about it that could be transferable to many other localities. And we hope that it will be worthwhile your time for spending it with us today. So thank you again for being with us. Now, you don't need to take my words for it. <laughs> I, for all you know, as um, uh, Dr. Nawal was saying earlier, I'm, I'm a person in a suit. And uh, sometimes the people in the front line and the people who actually saw the challenges that happened uh, around that pandemic could tell even more personal stories. But what we started realizing that the whole world, when they look at Abu Dhabi and they apply the objective assessment of what Abu Dhabi did, it's coming up with a good story to tell and share. So I'll share most importantly, the impact on patients. Abu Dhabi continued to be one of the lowest five locality in terms of mortality rate. Uh, Abu Dhabi continued to be one of the lowest in terms of infection rate. So continue to be just as of yesterday, our infection rate is about 0 
but 0 0.5 being the norm across the whole pandemic. So when we, if I bring you back to the start of the pandemic, everybody and the expert, we're talking about preventing a peak that overwhelm healthcare system and talking about taking measures to flatten the curve as, the, as was the term at the time. And this truly happened in Abu Dhabi. So we continue to have a manageable infection rate that allowed us and allowed the frontliners to do their best in order to prevent complications and death from happening and most importantly preventing people from getting infected in the first place. Now the added uh, benefit of knowing about Abu Dhabi story is all of this happened with zero days of lockdown. So we had some restrictions of movement between 10 o'clock at night and 6 o'clock in the morning. So anybody who's into clubbing were stopped from doing that. But apart from that, people continue to go to the supermarket during the day hours whenever they want to, to continue to mingle with the uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, applied in terms of social restrictions of the mass or washing the hands and continue to go about even for a drive or a walk or uh, uh, getting some exercise going. So I, for one, don't know that many localities that had zero days of full lockdown apart from Abu Dhabi. And that's what we went through and that's what we think it's worth bearing in mind if we are to quote lessons learned from different localities when looking at policies and procedures we need to apply for this pandemic, the next wave maybe, or the future ones when we come out of this collectively as a global community, more resilient facing the future. And also what we said, so Charlie was saying earlier, the deep knowledge group looked at about over 50 cities and, and looked at the objective assessment and decided to put Abu Dhabi there. I welcome all of you to have a look at it because we do have a look at it, not for the sake of saying where our ranking is, but to look in specific about where we can improve for the next part and what can we maintain in order to prevent or to take care of the populations we, we are responsible for. We also have consumer cho choice and across the UAE there are a couple of uh, three other figures. So UAE currently is the number one uh, country in terms of vaccination rate. So over 90, almost 90% of the population have been fully vaccinated. And we started our booster dosing, and Dr. Farida will talk more about the vaccination. Testing has been one of the key elements in our momentum to fight the pandemic. We went heavy from day one in terms of testing, and that served us well, not only for the sake of preventing and catching the infection and breaking the chain early, but also in terms of value for money of preventing people from it being admitted to the hospital. And last but not least, the Bloomberg with the latest ranking has put, it's great that we are in Spain, uh, that put uh, UAE joint second with Spain as the best countries in response to COVID in terms of economy, in terms of COVID resilience, and in terms of uh, the freedom of travel, so to speak. And then we, we mentioned in the video the different awards for the different components, being a digital, uh, being a, the governance and leadership and the likes of it. Uh, I always like to talk about architecture and when we put pictures, they, because, because they are related to buildings that I find very interesting. So this is Etihad, Etihad Towers. Etihad means union. Uh, so one of the key elements on the principles of the UAE that came over the last two months is about the union of the seven Emirates and how we can work together in order to put UAE as, as united as we can be to, to the wider world. Now, I'll just take you through the picture and why this picture is important. So this picture is of, of people, albeit at some leadership, walking around in, in a place called Expo. If you haven't heard about it, then we need to tell you about it. So Dubai Expo 2020 is the largest single event post the pandemic. It got postponed from last year to this year. But this year, up, up to today, three million people visited within the course of six weeks. This is not an easy feat, especially when you are living through a global pandemic. And it is expecting by March there will be between 15 to 20 million people 
visiting this space. It's about the size of, twice the size of the Vatican, and it's got representatives from about 190 countries from around the world. There are lots of people visiting from all over the world. There are people within UAE going to that place. But in order to allow the different individuals who are walking through this in daylight, and the general public, and I've, I've got more pictures that shows even more crowded <laughs> uh, elements of, of the expo. And in order to pull the greatest show on earth, there's a lot of work that happened in the background. And that's, we try to, to put in the framework on, on your right hand side. How did this happen? Where, how did we arrive to today? And we'll take you through the different elements. So we all know about, you need to work on prevention when you're fighting a pandemic. You need to break the chain early. You need to educate people. We'll go into details into that. Then if people catch the, the virus, then you need to set up a treatment pathway that will prevent people from either dying or having long COVID. So get them out of the hospital with the right outcome as soon as possible. And we'll talk about that. And the vaccination and how did we amount to having the, the number one in terms of vaccination and how did we go about it from the day that we knew within two months of the start of the pandemic that vaccination is going to be one of the key factors in getting the country out of the pandemic and getting the world out of the pandemic. And what did we start doing in March 2020 around this? Uh, so all of that goes into preparations early, anticipating early and preventing early. Now it's easy for us to say, okay, we understand it. It's prevention, treatment, vaccination. Everybody more or less is doing prevention, treatment, vaccination. Now it works in some places, it doesn't work in other places. So then we give you why it's different. What happened about Abu Dhabi and UAE that made it different. And we think it's kind of, like, as Hind always say, it's like a tapestry. So a tapestry to, to stop the smallest, it's not even an organism, the smallest creatures on earth from impacting society, humans and community and even countries. So you need to make it sometimes ironclad and what happened is you've got the governance and leadership playing a very important role all the way. Digital research and innovation to provide the science base and the data to, to do it. Collaboration, we, we had all the way through the last three days about collaboration. People collaborating left, right, center, up, down, all the way. And I know it's overused word when you think about it and you reflect on the conferences or the meetings that you attend. But it truly, we felt it, one, it was one of the key deciding factors on the success or the, the challenge of the pandemic. When it exists and it's done in the right way, it can work as a miracle. And last but not least is communication, marketing, and empowering the people that you're responsible for to contribute and to help you a long way in making the pandemic a success. So we'll go through the, this one by one. The way we're going to do it, we'll draw on the, uh, on the expertise and the uh, experience, the front uh, line or the people responsible in doing this. So allow us, I wouldn't call it double act, but more of a quadruple act with, the, with Dr. Farida, Dr. Noel and, uh, and him. Okay, so if we can start with the preparedness and prevention, Dr. Farida, the mic is yours. Okay, great. So uh, thank you, Dr. Amar, and I'll take it from here regarding the preparedness and uh, uh, being ready to deal with uh, cases. Um, I think our uh, strategy focused on four main domains. The first one is be, to be prepared to deal with pandemic. It needs investment years ahead of time. If you start after you get the pandemic, it's too late. And I think we learned the lesson early because we had mers -CoV in our region that has caused a lot of challenge in, in handling the cases. And we invested as a government 
a lot in terms of building the infrastructure uh, of the healthcare system, building the technologies that can enable us to integrate data and have a one unified data system, and also helped us to uh, uh, expand our lab capabilities. So the first cases that we got uh, in February, we were one of the first countries to uh, diagnose cases coming from Wuhan, from China, because we had to develop uh, kits that were developed in-house because there was no commercial kits available at that time. So being prepared to deal with pandemics require ahead of time being able to invest and dedicate resources to be ready to deal with any future pandemic. The first thing is, uh, and the unique thing about our strategy is the testing. What is unique about it is that we focused on proactive and uh, not waiting for the cases to come. Where other countries really focus on symptomatic cases, our strategy was to uh, test the high-risk group early on, try to identify the cases very early. So we expanded our testing capacity. We started, I remember, with 100 uh, tests per day, then 1,000 tests per day, and then we, we worked with the private sector and different stakeholders to reach a capacity of 150,000 tests per day. We are currently up to 300,000 testing we are doing per day, which is really covering at least 5% of our population on daily basis in our search capacity. And this is important because this makes tests more affordable in terms of pricing. The more you do, the less price it it goes, so it is more affordable. But also the government dedicated free testing for the high risk group, for the most vulnerable groups, including the labor workers who were not able to afford the testing. So we, ha we developed a strategy where we focus our resources on proactive screening, trying to outreach the vulnerable groups, uh, trying to open access for everyone and educate the public and engage with them to uh, educate them when to go to, to get the testing. Also, in terms of the testing outlets, we believe that if we limit ourselves to clinics and hospitals, we will be limited in terms of capacity. So we opened more outlets for testing, such as uh, we used uh, drive-through tents, we built uh, mobile clinics, and also we used social venues that were designed to be uh, large in capacity used for events, public events like weddings. It was converted to a PCR testing places. In addition, we, had, we contracted with the private sector to do a home testing that you saw in the videos to reach the most vulnerable elderly population who were not able to be mobilized. Um, we were sending uh, field teams to labor camps where they will not have the time to get from their work and go. So we were reaching them into different uh, locations, working places or living places, just to ensure that we are not missing anyone. So by this active strategy, active case finding, we could identify cases very early, and we noticed that around 40%, and this was around February, March, 40% of our cases tested were totally asymptomatic. At that time, we didn't know their role in terms of the disease transmission, but we decided to deal with them as infectious. So we took all the actions. The second part of the testing is, or the actions preparedness is to trace trace the contacts and make sure that they are also tested, isolated, and others. So we used our databases, different platforms, data platforms to identify close contacts, whether they were work-related, home-related, or community contacts. And we tried also to be proactive and asking, calling them. We had to expand our uh, contact tracing capacity using volunteers, uh, hiring additional employees, and outsourcing some of those capacities as well. And then the last part was the treatment. So we worked uh, closely with the hospitals, clinics, but we believe that the challenge that many countries faced was the capacity. So we had to de redesign our system in a way that we are testing a lot. So asymptomatic cases will cause a huge burden. We developed our home isolation program, which focused more on a low risk, 
asymptomatic cases that should stay at home and be isolated. We used a lot of technologies, telemedicine, uh, tracing watches, and uh, we provided a lot of services outside the hospital scope just to give more room to the hospitals to focus on really critical and high-risk uh, patients. So by this way, we could uh, categorize our positive cases based on their priority risk and deal with each one of them differently based on our evaluation and medical assessment. And then we will move to the treatment. Thank yeah, thank you, Dr. So th this is the first part, the prevention and preparedness. It's got a lot of work, as you heard, going into it. From preparing it, uh, so the preparedness that Dr. Farida was talking about, and then the testing, tracking, and isolating. Now, if somebody get infected, then they move into the next phase. Apart from the one that are asymptomatic, mild, they need to be followed up through Dr. Farida and the different people and the different teams. But if they get infected, then we go, they need to be treated. And Dr. Anwal and Hint, would you like to talk about the Can treatment? you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So when it comes to treatment, first, let me clarify something for you. In Abu Dhabi, anyone will be treated, anyone with COVID, regardless their insurance status or their uh, visa status. So even if they are visitors, even if their visa expired, even if their insurance expired, everyone will be treated. And this is the rule. And treated equally. There is no difference in treatment between any of them, simply because we have a dedicated centers for treatment and to treat everyone. So let's say someone turned positive. Because of frequent testing, we do see positive cases. Anyone who's positive will receive uh, a phone call. And if, the, if he's symptomatic, will be directed to something called COVID hub or to the hospital based on the case. If need uh, COVID hub, it's uh, basically a primary center. Actually, we convert many big areas to primary center where we utilize the ambulatory health services to do full evaluation, including clinical, radiological, and laboratory evaluation. And based on the evaluation, we'll, we'll decide on management and whether this patient will require admission or not. If the patient is sick, we'll go to a dedicated emergency room. And we have so many pathways, and we revise so many pathways. Actually, our healthcare workers was so adaptive because we end up changing a lot of pathway with different evidence. And if the patient needs hospital, will be evaluated in the emergency room, required admission will be admitted to the acute or uh, to the ICU. Now, in terms of treatments that we use, we are, initially when we start to treat pa patients, there was no evidence. So we try to learn from the countries that was affected initially, like China and the East, and then we learn from Europe. So we are using different medication. We are using uh, steroids. We are using immune modulators. And when the map came out, UAE was the first country to authorize it after the FDA. Actually, two days after authorizing FDA, it was authorized in UAE. And we were the first country to use it outside the clinical trial. And as you know, monoclonal antibodies is very expensive. We develop a guideline and a protocol where it is used early. And actually, it prevents a lot of death. So it's used for any positive high-risk patients, again, regardless their insurance status. And it helped a lot in saving lives, because this is the purpose of the whole exercise. Save as many as uh, you can. Uh, then with the, sorry, in terms of daily scientific protocol, Department of Health produce a daily updated scientific protocol that are shared with all the key uh, people in the healthcare facilities. So we, it's very difficult to keep up with all the publications. So everything is summarized and sent to us by email. And that, another thing was very helpful uh, for us and for all the frontliners to keep updated. Uh, we did talk the protocols. Now, in terms of workforce, 
because if we do a lot of evaluation and we manage, and we do believe early treatment made a huge difference, and this is one of the reasons why we have low mortality rate even in our ICU. So there was a difficulty when it come to manpower. So what we did in the hospital, we restructured it. Uh, Ms. Hind will talk more about it, but what we did, we used the private, so there was collaboration between government and private. Uh, and, but each team is led by a senior consultant. So we didn't leave it to the people who are juniors. Juniors work, all of them work together, but always overseen, uh, like large team overseen by a senior consultant. And that actually did make a huge difference in terms of our outcome. As you know, the senior consultant will, be, will know how to manage and we standardize the pathway and everything available in our electronic medical records. So it's easy to follow, even if you are not expert in COVID, but there are steps and there are a uh, way of managing the patients that are followed by everybody. You want to continue, Dr. Dr. Can you hear me? Yes, in terms of workforce, as uh, Dr. Nawal said and my colleague said, we had a great collaboration between public and private sector where we've been uh, able to reallocate the resources and the key success factor was that kind of collaboration. This term, we've been he hearing it uh, since our uh, three days now. Um, and uh, the key element that uh, for the Department of Health could allocate these resources is because we have invested in a digital health or a digital platform. We have a digital plat platform that was uh, shown in the video called Estijaba. Estijaba in Arabic means response. So in Estijaba or in response platform, we have three layers. One of them is the workforce. We've been identifying easily and allocating them through that uh, uh, platform, uh, identifying their capabilities, their qualifications, and reallocating them accordingly based on the needs and the demand. Uh, and also, some of the uh, providers were approaching us uh, to facilitate repatriation of their staff who stuck abroad during the mass uh, civil aviation suspension and during the mass lockdown. So we've been taking those big ticket to our uh, leadership or our uh, uh, top management to facilitate bringing back those uh, staff uh, in order to assess the, uh, the sector. Uh, the other layer uh, that uh, need to tackle is the capacity. The capacity is also in that uh, platform, also in Estijaba, where it shows the exact uh, operation, live base, in every single facility. This platform is integrating all the facilities that is licensed by the Department of Health. It shows the, the current occupancy rate, the admission rate, the discharge rate, the, the patients who are in the ER right now. Um, is it an ICU? Is it HDU? Is it a PICU? So it has all these types within that uh, Estijaba platform. And this platform, the data, the information that we have, it helped us in forecasting the worst case scenarios in collaboration with Abu Dhabi Public Health Center uh, and also with UAE scientific uh, uh, universities where they give us the worst case scenario, what will be the bad wave that we, uh, we might face. And based on that, we build our capacity where we've been able to increase the capacity from uh, up to 300% uh, within uh, two months. 200% actually was uh, within eight weeks. Uh, we uh, orchestrate and structure that surge planning uh, w within four phases. Each phase has different action card, which uh, Dr. Amr gonna elaborated physically here. Um, every single uh, employer or every single facility, they know their, their role and responsibilities whenever this uh, phase been activated. So uh, the, 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 uh, the phases, we have the four phases and we have the, uh, we've created the threshold and uh, a trigger to activate the, um, the next phase. And guess what? The maximum that we have reached is up to phase two. And we did not uh, get into toward the full uh, occupancy. We've also designated COVID facility based on the complexity of the cases. Uh, some of the, the hospital were running their daily operation, um, COVID, non-COVID uh, facility, we call them clean hospitals. Uh, and also we kept the, uh, the entire uh, facilities to be at the four phase, uh, at, uh, fourth phase to activate 
10,000 beds if, God forbid, we hit with the worst wave. But thank God, the maximum that we have reached was the phase two. Uh, and uh, this wouldn't be happened without the great collaboration between different entities within the sector. Thank you, Hind. Thank you, Dictora. So, uh, as Dictora uh, Nawal was saying and uh, Hind was saying, so in order to get your, your, your capacity and treatment ready to prevent infections and prevent death, so the things around the updated protocols catching up with the science, and sometimes if the science is not catching up with the pandemic, started to create the research and started to find the answers about it, and being agile to do it all the time. The workforce and the capacity are very important aspects. So you can't treat people without uh, the right healthcare workers, and you can't uh, treat them outside in, in a house. You need a dedicated facility to do that. And I think what the, the one personally that I always refer back to is the identifications of hospitals that are fully COVID dedicated. What that does is pooling the expertise and making that expertise available for all patients. So instead of a patient being treated differently in a hospital that only treat one COVID patients every month, all of them are dedicated in one facility with the doctors, with the systems, with the processes and the technology dedicated to uh, uh, prevent them from developing complications or, or dying. I just want to draw on a story about the availability. And we, we talked earlier in the day with Dr. Omuna uh, session about universal healthcare. Uh, it's true, around the world, universal healthcare has proved it's a very important factor in having a, a, a good response to the pandemic. If you start identifying, is this person able to pay or is this person not able to pay and would they be able to access or would they not be able to access, it spells disaster on the longer term. These patients, you will still be responsible for them. You will still be responsible for their care. And the, the later you provide the right care for them, the more expensive it's going to be on your system. So focusing early, telling everybody you have free access of care, irrespective of how, what your case is going to be, was a key deciding factor. I remember, Victoria, in the early days of the pandemic, some of the early cases came from fishermen who are from other countries and they got infected while on ships. The first port they they made a call on to say, we have some staff who are infected. They decided Abu Dhabi or Dubai because they know they, they will get treated, they will be taken care of. And that's what happened as an ethos all the way through the pandemic and saves us a lot of lives, most importantly, but saved a lot of cost down the line. And we, we feel that is a lesson that is worth sharing with everybody around the world on this aspect, especially. Uh, now, we heard about, I'll, I'll keep repeating, so we heard about the preparedness and the prevention. We heard about how we set up capacity, prevention, and treatment to the highest level in order to prevent death and complication. And then we move to one of the most important factors where we are talking about today, which is the vaccination program. So I'll hand off to Dr. Farida, who was one of the key architects and implementer of this. Dr. Tvalo. Thank you, Dr. Amr. So with vaccination, I think um, um, we started the uh, vaccination program in October 2020, ahead of most of the countries. And what really enabled us to start early is the clinical trials that were uh, uh, done in UAE. So we got the, access for, uh, the early access for the data about the performance of the vaccine, its safety and its efficacy, that gave us a confidence to start on the emergency authorization and start vaccinating. And um, we were thinking of what will be the best strategy. We did uh, predictive modeling studies, and we could see that for us, because of the unique structure of our population, majority of our population actually from the age of 20 to 40. And we have a very small percentage of our population above 60. So when we try to uh, simulate what will be the best uh, plan, uh, we couldn't see any major difference uh, wh whether we start with above 60 or uh, the young adults population. So we decided to have a merged a plan and merge strategy. We used um, the uh, segregation of risk factors. We started with the high risk group, elderly, and frontliners. 
And uh, very quickly, we moved into the expansion of uh, vaccinating the young adults, especially that we have a lot of, uh, we consider them a, a vulnerable population, the workers community who live in a high density population. So we decided to do outreach campaigns in the vaccination. This was end of uh, 2020. So by the first quarter of 2021, we were, we achieved more than 50% of the high risk population and the targeted population that we decided. We expanded to the whole community as well, just to catch up. Currently, we are up to more than 90% of our population vaccinated with two doses at least. In addition, uh, we, we reached also a good coverage when it comes to the booster dose. So um, expansion very quickly required us again, uh, use the same strategy for the PCR, expand our capabilities beyond health facilities. Uh, we use private sector and outreach campaigns because we believe that um, the, uh, the outreach will help to improve the access, especially for populations who might be busy and not reaching. And in the same time, we launched an uh, awareness campaign I think uh, even from the surveys that were done, the acceptance uh, of the vaccine in our community was higher than other countries because we started the engagement very early in August when we launched the clinical trial for Sinopharm. At that time, we decided to do a large campaign and engage the community. This helped to prepare our community, whether they were uh, healthcare workers and other community who uh, were also uh, volunteering in the clinical trial and their family members were getting alerted that there will be a vaccination campaign coming. So preparing the community ahead of time helped us to get more acceptance among healthcare workers and frontliners and other community members. And we are fortunate to be one of the um, uh, top countries in terms of the vaccination coverage. We started with Sinopharm, but we quickly also added up. We decided to have a mixed vaccination strategy because of the wide variety of our uh, population. In addition, the continuity and the sustainability of the program, you know, the, the logistics and the continuous supply was an issue. So we never had a shortage, a full shortage of vaccination. The program was ongoing with different vaccines. Currently, we have more than uh, around eight, eight types of vaccines that are licensed in UAE, many of them are available uh, to different extents, uh, but mainly majority of the population vaccinated with either Sinopharm or a Pfizer vaccine. In addition to that, uh, because we moved ahead of most of the countries, uh, we noticed based on our data, our continuous assessment, um, and we had also in parallel to the vaccination campaign, the clinical trials going on. So we were learning across the journey and getting a lot of data that helped us to adapt and uh, update our uh, decision making and policy processes. So uh, the, the booster vaccine also we started early because we could see from our data indicators, there is, um, we could see a, a surge in the number of people who got vaccinated and they passed more than six months from the Sinopharm vaccine. We started the booster around June. Uh, 2021, uh, and then we are also updating that to expand. We started with the high-risk groups, and then we expanded to the whole population. So uh, learning from the international community was important, but also because we were ahead of the game, we had to build indicators that could help us to learn more about the context, the local context, and the information that we had our about our population, about ca our cases, and the different variants that were uh, in our community compared to the global community as well. So based on our risk assessment in June, including having the new variants that was that uh, that was there, like the beta variant and others, and also uh, starting to see hospitalization and ICU admissions among vaccinated, we decided just to move quickly in terms of public health policy and to start the booster vaccination for the high-risk group. And then we, we moved into the 
the other community and we expanded the booster dose. So currently you will see many of the people who are visiting Europe or other countries are really most of them uh, took the booster uh, dose before they travel. So this is in, in a nutshell, um, I think moving early is important, moving fast, but also the expansion and the access because some of the delays in the coverage could be because of lack of access or lack of information. So building the trust, sharing the information ahead of time and preparing the community really helped us to achieve a very high uh, levels of coverage when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccination. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, another, uh, just an addition, it's about the, uh, the logistics and the vaccine logistics. As uh, the group appreciate, many of the vaccines that we're dealing with today require a specialized logistical environment that did not exist before. So many of the vaccines, what we call traditional vaccines, require two to eight degree uh, Celsius in terms of storage distribution and transport. Now, a lot of the vaccines are the one that going around the world requires minus 20 or minus 80. And that's also one of the other things that we moved early on. We, tried, we started at realizing that the new technologies platforms of, of vaccines require specialized temperatures that did not exist bef before. As one of the areas that we, we worked on, we started looking at the technologies that support doing that. The technologies that will allow the transport, the distribution and the storage. We talk to people in, in oil and gas industry to identify, well, what can they do around liquidified gas? What temperature does they use? We talk to uh, people who use frozen food and how they transport it. And then we started realizing we have capacity in Abu Dhabi that was coming online very soon, 2020. And that capacity today amount to about 6 billion doses of vaccine. We're able to transport, distribute, and store through Abu Dhabi. An added capacity exists in Dubai, making UAE one of the main logistical hubs around the world, and some of the numbers speak for themselves. So about, I think up to today, uh, through Dubai, there's been about 300 million doses passing through to the wider world, and through Abu Dhabi, about 190 million doses, making UAE one of the biggest hubs around vaccine distribution. But we'll come to more about the collaborations and the giving back uh, later. I'm conscious that we, we're telling this story, but we're taking too, too long without boring you guys. We'll, we'll move very quickly on the next part. Now, we, we, we looked at the main parts of the response to the pandemic, but now we, we're looking at the smaller parts that contribute to each of the uh, different parts. We talked earlier about the tapestry. And then one of the first one is about leadership and governance, is how do you make your, your governance in a way allowing the the information to flow very quickly to where decisions are happening and for the decisions to be implemented very quickly where it needed to be implemented. What we did is there are four principles and that's across UAE and in, in Abu Dhabi in particular. Uh, I remember early in the pandemic we got a circular from the leadership saying this is now how we're going to operate because we are in a global pandemic and it's an emergency. So some of the principles is don't let bureaucracy get on the way of taking decisions. Another one is good decisions taken early is much better than a perfect decision that is too late. So you need to take decisions, amend, be agile. And whatever we do, make it science-based. If the science is not there, let's work with the different scientific teams in order to generate the science through research or through expert examinations, data driven. So we need to look at every single aspect of the response and identify the data that will be available live. Now, if they are not available, let's invest in making these data available in a week or in four days or in two weeks time. And then agile and fast. So we can't, there, there has never been a, a kind of cautionness of take a decision today based on what's available today and go back on it in a few days' time. It's okay. As long as we are preventing people from getting the infection, as long as we are uh, uh, preventing complications or death from happening, it's fine to make the decisions and then re-examine it and possibly reverse it in a week time. And last but not least is high reliability. Whether, wherever there is a, 
a process that continuously being done, like the one in testing, like the one in vaccination, like the one of examining the capacity and ramp up the capacity. Make detailed processes and SOPs for the different people on different layers of the, uh, the response to have the confidence in what they are doing. We will talk later about it, and I know Charlie is going to ask about this, is how we develop the learning around it in order to have it specific and talking to the different level of experience of the people being part of that response. So being it a volunteer that just came from university without any previous exposure in healthcare, all the way to the likes of Dictora Farida, who is the expert, or Dictora uh, Nawal, who is also the expert in treatment. We need to factor in all the different experience, different understanding. And in between, the role models. Uh, I just want to, how, how important leadership is. So the leadership of Abu Dhabi and UAE, one of the key things they did is first assure the public they are, we all in this together. So I'm, I'm going to say this and it might be controversial. We looked at the different news, especially at the early, early on in the pandemic. Many of the leadership of different countries said, be prepared to say goodbye to loved ones. And that happened very early on in the pandemic. It's kind of saying, we're going to take decisions, but we are not sure they are going to work. I contrast this with another phrase that is very famous in Abu Dhabi and, and, and UAE, which says, don't worry, health, food, and livelihoods are top priority, we will take care of. So it, it's kind of giving that assurance to the public and supported by actions on the ground. So you can see leadership going on and about all the time. They are present there when they are opening field hospitals. They are present there when they are talking to healthcare workers. They are present there when they are meeting or receiving medications or vaccines. They are present there when they are sending support to other countries. They are present there when they are communicating with the public or hearing from the public on what's happening and what's their uh, uh, challenges that they are facing. And it doesn't matter if you are present on the land of UAE, you are being protected and the worry about food, healthcare or livelihood is being taken care of. So that is the promise they give and translated that promise into different actions. And that makes a huge difference when you've got people like Dr. Nawal, uh, people like Dr. Uh, Farida and, fr and many others frontline workers on how much they give and the commitment they exhibit. Because when they see that commitment coming from the top leadership, I'll give an example on, I was telling Dr. Nawal earlier. So sometimes we, we prepare reports or prepare an action plans and finish it by two o'clock in the morning. And I, I, I for one was hesitating, shall I send it now or send it in the morning? Because I know if I send it two o'clock in the morning, I'll get a call to go through it in, two, in half an hour time. And I wanted to sleep. <laughs> But you, you have to send it, you, you, because I know that leadership is there. They are waiting at two o'clock in the morning and they will be there first thing to, to, to give instructions or to have a discussion first thing in the morning. So that's the kind of what the importance of leadership and governance around it. We talk about digital research and innovation. Dr. Anwar, if you, if you can invite you for about the research and, sure. and the digital innovations around it. Yeah. So I'll start with the research. We uh, conducted the first and the largest single center um, uh, clinical trials to test inactivated vaccine. That was in the summer 2020, and it did help us a lot. Dr. Farida already explained that. And after that, actually, right now, we are doing almost a total of eight clinical trials. And by the way, before that, we used to have almost zero uh, large clinical trials. We did have small clinical trials here and there, but during the COVID, we managed to, be, to participate, and I think our data will help a lot. In terms of uh, our research, our publication, we work with the universities, public health, clinicians to, produce, to publish uh, our experience and the data. In terms of digitalization, I'll start with Al-Hassan. Al-Hassan is an app that almost everyone in UAE 
will, uh, they have to, not they have to, but everyone usually download it on, on their phone and by this app, you can access your PCR results, you can print your PCR results, you can access your uh, vaccination certificate at any time. Public health use it to identify, because it is a real time uh, result, they can identify where is the positive cases, what, it, what they called heat, heat map. Heat yeah, if there is any cluster of cases, so they can move early in identifying the cases and manage it and implement uh, the preventive measures that are needed. We are the first of the top five uh, countries to deploy sewage early sensing of COVID-19. And of course, we have our uh, emergency uh, manual that available um, uh, as an app and also available uh, as a hard copy. It's a reference for everyone who work in uh, emergency preparedness. We have many dashboards, okay, so we do share the data all the time, whether you are a frontliners where you receive data and updates uh, or you are a decision maker. So we always share the same data and we are almost on a daily basis and there is real time data where you can see the admissions, the number of cases, uh, ICU admissions. So that helped us a lot in planning and managing our day to day plus the future planning and many others uh, app that we implemented uh, during this pandemic. I try to be short. Okay. <laughs> Doctor, so we, we talked about the collaborations earlier and how it is one of the uh, key differentiating factors. Doctor, would you, Doctor yeah, Fraser, would you I, like I to just comment? I would on? like to brief. Uh, I think the collaboration, uh, we, we had the belief that uh, success of one country is not enough to deal with the pandemic. It's a global event, so we need to support other countries as well. And we started this collaboration just from the first uh, repatriation that happened from Wuhan came to UAE carrying uh, students from all uh, the region who were not able to go to their countries. So we hosted them. We, uh, we had to prepare a resident city uh, to deal with them, isolate them. We had ma very little information about COVID-19 at that time. But uh, hosting those students in our country helped us to prepare very quickly. And later on, we used this humanitarian city, we call it, uh, for isolation of our cases in UAE. We worked with WHO uh, and the international community to support co other countries by providing um, PCR kits, uh, logistics support, transporting uh, some of the, uh, uh, of the needs that they required during the pandemic. And this also continued uh, when we started to have the vaccination to support other countries providing some vaccines to them directly. Uh, later on, we launched the HOPE Consortium, which is a public-private collaboration and uh, supported uh, by the government to ensure that uh, the logistic infrastructure that we built in UAE, which really surpassed our need, was built to support the region and the whole global community to be utilized as a global hub for transportation, for purchasing, for also storing uh, vaccines, because we believe that this was a huge gap in many countries who lack the infrastructure. So collaboration is really a big in our agenda, and we continue to work closely with the international community to support the needs, because at the end, it's really about the collective response, not only the UA response. And maybe I'll move quickly to the communication part. Yeah. Uh, again, I think the communication uh, played a key role in the success story of our uh, um, uh, story in Abu Dhabi and United Arab Emirates. So um, we had, uh, uh, I think, the understanding of your people, your, your community needs as the first to be able to tailor the messages based on their needs. Uh, the, the, what we have is a multinational community that required us to really have a good understanding of what will be the best way to reach this community. So for example, uh, uh, we have around 20% of our community or the speakers. So we had to really tailor the messages. We know that, for example, they use Facebook. So the Facebook was 
uh, very much targeted to this group of population. Using segmented messages, multi-languages, uh, different means of communication, and the social ma media played a major role. For, for example, for the Ordo speakers, we had to use um, uh, different uh, engagement, including uh, uh, collaboration with Bollywood stars to educate them about wearing masks and to talk to their language and try to uh, uh, emphasize on the new daily habits that they have to live with. And they also educated them about PCR centers in their regions and others, just to help them understand in their language what should be the response and how we can empower, our, our empower them to help them to be protected from the pandemic. So uh, also I think the fear and the panic that started in the beginning of the pandemic was huge. And I think this was a global issue. So our message, having a unified message across different sectors, coordination between health and non-health entities, uh, and there is no uh, ensuring that there is no conflicting messages because this cre uh, cr could create a confusion in the community. So directed message, uh, evidence-based, clear and transparent helped us to build a trust between the government and the community and to uh, have more engagement with different community segments. And we also tailored the messages to different groups like healthcare workers have a whole communication strategy that built in addition to government employees, parents had uh, to be outreached as well on education of their children and school um, and many other segments in our community that we believe that it is important to have a one unified message but in a different uh, uh, outlets and a different means to reach the right group of population. Thank you, Victor. So uh, I, th I think uh, the, the, there's a, uh, in English saying they say, don't let a, a good crisis go to waste, right? <laughs> so one of the things that we're coming out of this is what are the opportunities we're going to take forward? What are the things that we learned, we developed, uh, and we want to keep? So things around the establishing our manufacturing base. All over the world, PPE has gone through a crisis, especially early on in terms of logistics and in terms of provision. What we did as well as procuring this is starting to build our own base of manufacturing. That went on, and Dr. Farida was mentioning this in the morning. So we had, for example, Strata, who used to manufacture airplane wings. They shifted within a couple of months to provide high-level PPEs needed in level three setting, like the ICU or isolation centers, uh, like the masks or the PPEs, as well as the private. They started ramping up their capacity. And now we're looking at vaccine manufacturing in UAE and Abu Dhabi. We're looking at monoclonal antibodies and being a life science hub for the future. We want to be a logistical center, and that's with the, with mainly driven by two of the biggest international airports existing in UAE, uh, being it the one in Dubai and the one in, in Abu Dhabi, which is serving many of the regions that want to, um, to, to be served by the medications either being manufactured or stored uh, in UAE. Also, the digital story has been a key story, and I'll come to discuss it in a minute. But also the approach that we applied in order to save lives and how to work together, which is one of the most important elements in really cohesive way, not doing things for the sake of doing them as a token and to take uh, a mark, but rather than doing it well and implement them in the right way and making sure they have the right impact in a sustainable way. And that's many of the engagement that we want to uh, engage with the world on. Now, I'll, I'll just give you a glimpse of the daily thinking we had, which is, I'm sure, you, you had the same. And would you like to go through this slide? Well, I'll, I'll just say that the quality has never been compromised. This is the entire philosophy. This is how we've managed COVID. Uh, it's by balancing between the quality and the economy. But again, the quality has never been compromised. Actually, it was uh, in our key critical pillars uh, during the entire pandemic where the team uh, inspecting and auditing uh, the, the sector just to assure and monitor the adherence on the quality control measurement and adhering to uh, COVID uh, protocols. Um, I'll leave the other part, the economic part for you, uh, hence you, mm. you like to talk about it. No 
So it's always, a, so when we talk about uh, preventing death and preventing complication, there need to be on immediate actions, but it needs to be taken with the, with the view that medium term and long term should not be neglected. Mental health is attached to economic impact. Uh, shorter term and universal health care is attached to economic impact. Livelihood of people and the worry they had or even the access with the right care if the livelihood is not there is also will have a health care impact. So both of them are impacting on each other and the decisions need to be taken in balance. Uh, what happened over the last two years is not something easy. Uh, not at a personal level, not at a society or government level. But uh, I think that the, the key takeaway from this is when the situation was the toughest and when the decisions were the hardest, healthcare came first. And that's what kept sustaining the whole balance that we're seeing in front of us. Uh, going forward, Dr. Fai, Dr. Farida, this is what we are doing on a daily basis now. We are in recovery mode, but Dr. Farida, if you can take us through it. Yeah, actually what we try to do is to develop a matrix uh, of data. We utilize the data that are existing within the healthcare system, but also we build on integrated with non-health data, just to ensure that we have the right indicators to monitor the population status, to be able to uh, do our surveillance for infectious diseases, to have additional tools that could help us to sense any risk, whether it is a hot area, a cluster, and uh, to intervene quickly. So the, this uh, matrix of data uh, and indicators that we were monitoring helped us really to uh, use it uh, and uh, to take the right decision based on the evidence, local evidence in addition to our access to the international data. So this is really the main pillar and we, we knew that uh, uh, having a target of zero cases is not sustainable. So what we were trying to do is to balance between the health needs and the surge capacities that we had and going back to normal. So we didn't close, we didn't shut down places, but we tried to balance between our capacities and what other uh, life activities that need to continue. So our target was to reach this kind of a balance that we fortunately to have it uh, until now, uh, despite all the global activities and global hot zones that we have uh, in COVID-19. Uh, I think if I can refer to one of the earlier presentations and one of the uh, speakers saying that the system over the last so many years been built in on just in time. While the, the pandemic required a system to be responding and be built just in case. So that's what we are now doing. We are building the system accordingly, but using a lot of the lessons learned and we think we are striking the balance with the use of digital. Some of the digital technologies that has been honed, tested, and proved successful, and we will be taking it forward, include cloud computing, facial recognitions, drones, uh, social media technologies, sensors, and advanced data analytics. What these are going to contribute to into the one that we are already building, where you've got lots of information that, if managed well and built in an AD sensing system, it will allow you time to respond most effectively to whatever the pandemic or whatever the early signs, even better than what we responded today in this pandemic. Coming to, down to a healthcare, to a country, to a social uh, uh, contrast that is more resilient following the last two years and the next few months, inshallah. With that, I'll leave you and I thank you very much, invite you to Abu Dhabi anytime that you want to enjoy the fruit of the whole UAE's work. Thank you. Wow. Do I speak for all of you? A one word response. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, there, there are actually no questions that have come in on my little magic pad here. Uh, We'll take questions if time allows, but there are two things that I'd like for us to be sure and touch on before we leave. The first is the uniqueness of your workforce. Your healthcare workforce is very international in nature. It, it must have created considerable issues in terms of families staying connected and 
all of the, the challenges that were faced around the world, literally. How did you deal with that? How did you manage the impact with the workforce? Okay, I might start. So it is not easy. However, I think our uh, healthcare worker was very adaptive and flexible. I think the re one of the reasons they felt they are supported by everyone, they felt safe. And actually many of them told me, I wish if my whole family are in UAE, uh, because they've seen treatment available for everyone. And we don't ask people who are sick to go and sit in their home. Then we did try our best when after wave one to facilitate uh, them moving uh, to go for a break or bring their families. There are so many stories we can tell where we manage even during difficult time uh, to fly their families, their children, their uh, spouse from other countries back to UAE. Yes, and when I spoke to people, <clears throat> excuse me, in Abu Dhabi, they were referring to flights to unite. Yes. Flights to unite. And it obviously made such a tremendous difference. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Omar, you've done some remarkable things in terms of memorializing the learning that has occurred. And again, why, in our limited time, would you mind showing the group what you've done? Yeah, sure. So this is the, the whole team work. So Part of what we did at the uh, start of the pandemic, uh, as Dr. Farida was saying earlier, you can never be too, too prepared. So we set teams aside to look at what we are doing, reflecting, examining, and what's happening around the world in terms of responding to the pandemic. What we did is we ended up with, with something which built on what's existing before, what we call the Abu Dhabi Pandemic Manual. So Abu Dhabi Pandemic Manual, it's designed in a way to reflect how people behave and think in, term, in, in, in times of crisis. And what are the tools and the processes you need to give to them in order to act very quickly and act effectively. So what we did is we looked at the different teams. So here you codify all the different actions that need to be taken at the different levels of the pandemic response across all the different teams that are involved in the pandemic response. And it's tailored in a way to speak to the individual who's taking part of that pandemic response. So if I can give you, so the, the healthcare response have three layers. So there is the, what we call the gold command, the silver command, and the, the bronze command. The gold command is made of different leaders and the different responsible entity, and they report to their national one. The Bronze Command is the one that involves public health and capacity. So they deal directly with the different hospitals. And the Bronze Command got 16 teams. So teams responsible for testing, teams responsible for quarantine isolation, team responsible for communication, team responsible for medical protocols and management. And what we did is, if this is too much for a volunteer, sorry, that is coming from the university today, we recruited into joining a certain team. Then the leader of that team, they just need the volunteer today to give them this leaflet, which include, and the leader will say, today we are red, and that person will look at all the ones marked red and they need to take actions against it. It also tells that volunteer what is the, so this one is quarantine and case investigation team. What is the, purpose of this team. So they always need to adhere to that. And also they tell them as a quarantine and case and investigation, you will be dealing a lot with these teams. And that within an hour will tell them an induction into moving early into taking actions. And that goes across all the 16 teams. We have that digitally, we have it AI enabled, and we have it as a software that we're hoping by the end of the year will gift it to the world. But uh, this is where, where we got to in order to achieve high reliability of the different actions. So if somebody is in the middle of the desert responding to a cluster or a case there, the actions there is going to be the same as them being in Sheikh Khalifa Medical City responding to the same thing in their hand. And that's what hopefully will prepare us 
It gets reviewed every six months to get the learning going. One of the things that it does look at, it, it's not only Abu Dhabi, it's not only UAE. We looked at about 20 countries on what the response has been shaped by, what the different factors that contributed to the success or the not so much success of that system and what are the lessons learned we can put into that. So as I briefly reviewed, particularly the, the condensed versions relative to each of the specific areas, they look like a project plan. It's actually quite remarkable in terms of how useful it will be for those who choose to take advantage. Say again how this will be made available. So we, we are talking with some of the leading universities globally to make it available as a digital version. But the idea is we, we want to gift it to the WHO at some point. So it doesn't matter if it's an advanced country like Germany or Italy or Spain, we're hoping, or a challenged country with a with an infrastructure that is not so great in the middle of anywhere, they will be able to deploy this. They just basically get, get it straight away to work on saving lives. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists to identify what they judge to be the most important lesson they have learned as a result of this experience. And while you're thinking about that, um, are there any questions from the group that you that are pressing you'd really like to be able to, to ask the panel yes please we did there is a mic yes yes thank you i'm risto mitunen from the ihf i'm still president for today and and uh, this was quite impressive really and, and uh, especially what stuck me was, was the last part of opportunities and developments. This was great, and I'd just like to elaborate a little bit on that here from you. And, and just as an example, I, I wouldn't like to be stuck in history. If we go back 80 years on more, uh, you quoted um, an, an English saying, and I, I would repeat that with Winston Churchill, who said that a uh, pessimist is a difficulty in every opportunity, whilst the optimist sees an opportunity in every difficulty. And this was the time of World War II. And uh, example, antibiotics. Alexander Fleming actually discovered penicillin in the early 30s, but it remained a curiosity until a disaster struck, being World War II at that time, and basically led to a widespread use of antibiotics. So using this as an example, I, I would like to hear a little bit more about your vision for the opportunities. Okay. If something uh, good would follow from this disaster. You're absolutely right. So uh, I think um, from this, if, if there is one thing on that, reflect on Charlie's uh, uh, example of, of what do we take away from this. So apart from the celebrating the lives saved and being saddened and learning from the lives lost, I think UAE is coming out of this with a huge confidence. Uh, before, if, you, if I reflect five years, three years' time, UAE has been great in, in aspiring. But I think with the crisis that happened globally around for the last two years, UAE in every single part of it is coming with the confidence that we say, here we are and we believe that we are. Our, our place in the world is definitely at the top, not for the sake of being number one or number two, but for the sake, we've got something to give the world and we are confident about it. Being it from the learning, being it from the applications of that learning and being it from the aspiration. I, I just want to give you, I've, I've been in UAE about eight years. I like to read, I'm all the tradition reading newspapers still. The team make a laugh of that every day. So um, eight years ago when I go through newspapers, it's quite localized the news. It's different from Financial Times or The Times. Today, when I read the newspapers of UAE, it talks about going to space. It talks about Operation 300, which is doubling the manufacturing output. It talks about doubling the population from 10 million to 20 million. It talks about being AI hub for the world. It talks about a genomic program being one of the largest in the world. It's definitely living at the edge of where science and what society is going to look like giving example, not a beacon of hope, not only for region, 
that is troubled by many things, but it's becoming a beacon of hope for the world now, and everybody is looking for it. So I think a lot of the learning is, is coming from that uh, Churchill and the penicillin and all of that. I, I wouldn't say we are far away from the similar circumstances that the world went through during World War II. This is definitely being a global event at a massive scale, not far away from World War II. Thank you. Uh, if I may just add one point here, that I think what really kept us on moving us very quickly is the vision that we had from our leadership is in the most difficult times that we had, they considered this as opportunity. So uh, where other countries maybe were fearful from investing uh, because it will cause economic crisis, our strategic thinking was what is the piece of uh, projects that we will invest in that will help us for the next 10 years to be prepared for the next pandemic. And this is how the decision process making. So being strategic, being for Think, forward thinking about how not to deal with today, but to deal with the 10 and 20 years, this is what makes the difference. Thank you. Thank you. So what about it? What's right at the top of your list of the most important lesson learned so far from your experience? Can I start? Hint, please. Thank you. Well, um, I'm so honored and so proud to be among these three main pyramids of Abu Dhabi. They were actually front, at the front line. Myself, I was, I was in the backstage orchestrating the capacity master plan. So to answer your question, what is the learning lesson? Planning, planning, and executive planning. Uh, there is a say, it says, don't make your poor planning my emergency. So that was my, you know, my role during the entire pandemic. It's to have a comprehensive, cohesive, holistic planning to make their life easier of the frontliners. Front Thank you. May I add something here? I think the rapid decision making is extremely important. Act fast. Don't aim for perfection because it will be too late. Don't wait for the ideal data because again, it will be too late. The other things is, as I said earlier, is easy and free access because in pandemic and infectious disease in general. You have to treat everybody. Thank you. If I may add to that is the role of public health today is even more important than yesterday and before. Uh, I could see that through the pandemic, some countries are lost uh, and public health was behind sometimes because of the political priorities, economic priorities, but what really saved life is, is the top of priority for any government to, to sustain and to continue work for the future. It's the people who makes the difference. So public health need to be in the forefront of any response to, public, uh, to pandemic and also in the future pandemic. So we need to strengthen the public health systems across different countries to be able to deal with any future infectious disease and any future emerging pandemic. I think if, if I take it at the global level, my learning is the world is a small village and the world is a big place. Uh, I think that the small, the small part is it took only about 10 days from one person to be infected to about a few countries being infected and took about two months for every single place on earth to be infected. And in terms of the response, there is now a big gap. Uh, there is a gap in terms of uh, vaccination. There is a gap in terms of access to healthcare. And I think we totally appreciate to, that nobody is out of this pandemic until everybody is out of this pandemic. It takes just a, a second wave or the third wave to produce a new variant and now we are back to square one, so to speak. So unless we, we act together to bring our response to pandemics uh, in a cohesive way, looking at the whole world as one population. We might be going through a different cycles until we get to the right place. And I think that's what we need to learn and work around. At different organization level, we, we heard from many of the international ones 
uh, today, and I think we, we need to bring everybody back together. We're offering Abu Dhabi as a place for you guys. So. <laughs> Thank, you. From there. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Two brief closing comments. At our opening plenary session, Deborah and uh, Sarah and Lucy talked about the importance of women leading in healthcare organizations. Is there any doubt <laughs> that it has made such a difference in the United Arab Emirates? <laughs> and the last is, before we arrived, we faced a global health challenge. And while we've been here and when we go back, we face a global health crisis. We need to learn from each other. It's probably the most fundamental ingredient to being prepared for the global health challenge that's unknown to us today that we will face in the future. I want to say to, to the panel, I believe you have made an important contribution to a healthier world by helping us learn together today. Thank you. And thank you for being here.